Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace. How readily and often that word flows out of the mouths of preachers. Everywhere. Modeled after Paul's greetings to the churches he visited and served, nearly every sermon begins with some kind of pronouncement of God's grace and peace. We say it, but do we ever struggle with it? And I don't mean just preachers. I mean all of us. Yet it's at the core, it's at the heart of our faith. We hear it every Sunday, at least up here, that we are forgiven for all the ways we fail to live out God's dream. God's loving intention for our lives and for God's creation. Jesus says to us, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. And then we pray the words that he taught his disciples, that he teaches us. And when we get to the fifth petition, we say, Forgive us our trespasses when we are using the version that the Lutherans borrowed from the Episcopals when we switched to using the English language. Or we say, forgive us our sins when we use the ecumenical version that is based on the 11th chapter of Luke. We'll do a study on this one day. It's not so much the asking for forgiveness part. If we're feeling honest, we know that we've blown it in a number of small and sometimes large ways. It's the part that continues after that. The part that says, as we forgive those who sin, who trespass against us. Do we? Can we? And what if we can't? Or we won't? Or we fail at trying? And here comes that nagging fear. Could it be that our forgiveness is dependent upon our forgiving? Well, taken on its own, this may be my absolute least favorite parable of Jesus. It's at least in the top three. This, he says, my heavenly Father will do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. And then we say, this is the gospel of the Lord. Okay, so here it is. I have to fall back to the position. I have to trust that in the big picture, in both Hebrew and Christian scripture, the overhanging umbrella over all the demands and all the judgments is the overwhelming and overruling grace of God, who again and again does not give up on God's creation, even us. And so I can affirm, even having just read this parable, forgiveness is not conditional. It's not transactional. It's not payment for something another one does. It's an act of grace. And that grace is a gift. The very word that we use in the English language captures this. We say forgiving. For giving, right? It's a gift, and a gift cannot be sold. And a gift cannot be an obligation, a should. Although we try to bend it that way. Oh no, we think. I just got a card from so-and-so. I owe her one. Have you ever thought or said that? I was invited over for dinner. I owe him one. Shoulds weigh us down. They make us feel guilty. If we think of gifts like payments or shoulds, then they're hard to let go of. Remember those old Sounder Transit commercials where someone is holding onto their car and they can't let go of it? You know, so that they can ride the train or the bus or whatever. It's kind of like that. You have to let it go if it's a gift. Maybe let it go, having been put to music, 
can help us remember these words or drive us crazy if you have a small child, especially a girl. Yeah. We know <laughs> that letting it go isn't easy, especially when it comes to forgiveness. There is so much of who we are in our sense of self wrapped up in offering or receiving forgiveness. Whether the experience of brokenness is between individuals, such as family members or friends or co-workers or fellow congregation members, or between groups of people, or even as a nation, as we remembered last Monday on 9-11. There was a documentary I saw once that followed a group of men who had served as soldiers in war. And what struck me out of this documentary was that one of the men said that he had come to hate, to actually hate all the people of the enemy country. And he carried that burden with him when he returned home. Not unusual, right? It was a torture, though, he said, inside of him. A poison that invaded his bloodstream and hardened his heart. It affected his relationships. His marriage broke up. He was unable to hold a job. He had no peace. He tossed and turned in the night and stumbled angrily. And he relived the horrors he had seen and participated in again and again. Well, he said in this documentary, he said he's begun to loose that burden, to loose that burden. As he has, he is gradually getting back his life. But how does one begin to loose the burdens of bitterness and regret and hatred that keep us unable to forgive an enemy people, a spouse, an employer, even maybe especially our sisters and brothers in Christ? Pastor and spiritual writer Richard Foster points out in his study, Celebration of Discipline, that forgiveness does not mean pretending that a hurt or an injury doesn't matter. That's okay. Right? doesn't mean that. Forgiveness doesn't mean the hurt stops, necessarily. It doesn't mean forgetting. It doesn't mean pretending that whatever relationship you had will be the same again. So a few thoughts. Forgiveness is about letting loose about something in the past that you cannot change. But even more, forgiveness is letting go of the hope that the past can be changed at all by anyone, ever, anywhere. We have no time machines, sorry, no time machines through which to travel and change the past. This letting loose of what cannot be changed isn't something that happens quickly. It takes time. It's an ongoing process. And in time, for, and in this, forgiveness is akin to grieving. It's a process. It has stages and some of them we go through more than once. Some of them we go through many times. In grief, we understand that we don't grieve once. We grieve seven or 77 or seven times 70 times, don't we? And so it is with forgiveness. It isn't necessarily the case that Peter is talking about someone who keeps on sinning against him. But perhaps it is that he, Peter has to keep forgiving and not be bound up every time he remembers the hurt. He has to keep on letting it go, keep on letting it go, and not let it keep him from turning toward the other or turning toward God. Sixteen years ago, my brother died. It was less than a month before 9-11. And you know, I still, still struggle with letting go of something I didn't do, something I didn't say to him that I look back and feel needed to be said before he died. What I have to keep letting go of, that I keep have to keep trying to let go of, 
has spent years sometimes torturing me at night, sending me spiraling time and time again into darkness and regret. For many of us, sometimes the hardest one to forgive is ourselves. Jesus' command to forgive applies even to that. But how? How do I forgive? How can we forgive the unforgivable in others or in ourselves? The soldier in the documentary that I mentioned learned to turn toward others instead of away. Joseph, in our first reading today, that's a great story. Joseph turned toward his brothers, right? He had good reason not to. The servant in the gospel parable that we read together today, that servant turned away. This turning toward is not easy, and it's nearly impossible to do on our own. It takes support and encouragement from others. It takes the effort of learning to love and working on love of the other. For all true giving, whether it's the offering you've put in the plate, the time you give to working at the food bank or teaching a class, or if it's forgiveness given, all true giving is rooted in love. That is the love of God in Jesus. The Jesus who says from the cross, forgive them, Father, forgive them. And he turns toward us and he calls us into relationship through our baptism. And he renews it every time we come to this table to receive the bread and the wine. It is a gift. There's a story I've heard about Corey Ten Boom, who was liberated from a Second World War concentration camp a few days after the Allies liberated or conquered Germany. Corey took up the arduous process of forgiveness, and eventually she felt that she had discovered the only power that could heal the people in Europe. So she went around many places, healing, preaching, sorry, preaching about forgiveness. She went to Holland, she went to France, and she spoke in Germany as well. One Sunday she preached in Munich to a crowd of people who were eager to be forgiven. After the service was over, a man walked up to her, and he extended his hand, and he said, Ja, Fraulein Ten Boom, I'm so glad Jesus forgives us all our sin." just as you say. She recognized the man. He was a guard in the concentration camp who had looked on contemptuously and leering when the women were forced to take showers. Corey remembered, and the man, with his hand reached out, expecting her to take it, she stood there with her hand frozen to her side, and she was stunned. She was stunned at herself. What could she do? She who had thought, she thought she had overcome the hurt. She thought she had overcome the hate that was inside of her. She had been preaching forgiveness to others. What could she do now that she was confronted by a person she absolutely, positively could not forgive? And so then she talks about, she describes how she at that moment prayed. She prayed, Jesus, I cannot forgive this person. I cannot forgive this man. Forgive me. That was her prayer. And at once, in a wonderful way, she says she felt forgiven. Forgiven for not forgiving. At that moment, her hand went up, took the hand of her enemy, and released him. And in her heart, she freed him from his past. And she freed herself from hers. My willingness to seek and to receive forgiveness at this table is a necessary step step to my letting go, to my shaking loose of past transgressions, whether they're my own or someone else's. But I can't do it by myself. We can't do it by ourselves. It's a gift of God, as I often say at the breaking of the bread. It is a gift of God for the beloved people of God.